But today we're going to uh, look at this uh, portion here in chapter 12. So let me begin reading at verse 7. I'll read to verse 11 and we'll get into our study. Acts chapter 12, verse, uh, verses 7 through 11. Luke writes, Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. His chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real. Thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So let me give to you a little bit of an introduction, a context, a reminder of what is taking place, and then we'll pick up at verse 7 and move through the verses before us this morning. Now, as we've been going through the book of Acts, we've noticed that though the church began, and when it began, it was doing very well, uh, very early within the, the uh, history of the church, persecution began to, to grow and has been growing through the book of, uh, of Acts as we've been going through it. Uh, it had started uh, by uh, the Sadducees when they had jailed the apostles Peter and John because they had been preaching the gospel. Remember that uh, at the gate called Beautiful, uh, Peter and John had been there. There had been a crippled man who was there at the gate. And uh, as, as Peter and John were about to enter in during the hour of prayer, this crippled man saw them anticipating that, the, that he would receive something from them. Um, Peter spoke to him and said, look upon us. And the man looked up expecting to receive. And, and that's when the apostle Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ. I say to you, stand to your feet and, and walk. You remember that, that had happened. And the man walking, leaping, and praising God gave the uh, apostle Peter opportunity to preach the gospel. Well, they were arrested. He was arrested for doing that. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 2, it says that uh, as Peter had been preaching that those who had arrested him, the Sadducees and all who had sent the officers to arrest him were very greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and they were preaching in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And as you already know, perhaps you don't know at this moment, the Sadducees, a religious group within the confines of the Jewish religion, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And so they considered what was being preached to be heresy. They were also agitated by the miracle that had been performed. And so as they were speaking amongst themselves in Acts 4, 16, they said, what shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. And so as they were Determining what to do, Acts 4.17 says that their response was to severely threaten them to no longer teach in the name of Jesus Christ. And so they severely threatened them and said, no longer teach or preach in his name. Now in our day, threats like that is all it takes to keep some from preaching the gospel. If, if somebody tells you not to do it and, and they're upset and they're threatening you, well, for many, that's, that's all it takes. And, but not for them, because after that, they continued to minister. Uh, it, it says that uh, Peter made it very clear that he would keep preaching. Acts 4.20, he said, we cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. We're not going to stop speaking. Well, once again, as we've been going through the book of Acts, they were jailed for preaching the gospel. And this time, the high priest in, in Acts 5.28, the high priest told them, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So at this point, the rejection is no longer simply verbal. Because in Acts 5.40, they called for the apostles, beat them, and commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. So persecution began with the religious, and it began verbally, and it began to move into the physical. 
From this point on, the threats are no longer simply threats. They're now beatings and other things. Because in Acts chapter 6, we saw how the anger towards the gospel continued to grow. Stephen, who was one of the first deacons, had disputed, and the Bible speaks to us concerning the fact that he spoke with these, these fanatical religious Jewish people. And so they couldn't defeat him. So what they did is they induced men to accuse him of, of blasphemy, and that led them to casting him out of the city of Jerusalem and actually executing him. Now Saul, who later becomes Paul, Saul was present at the execution, and the scripture says, and was consenting to Stephen's death. So persecution has grown. It's grown from threats and slander to beatings and now death. Jesus had forewarned his followers that this would happen. There would be an escalation. In Matthew 5, 11, he said, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. When he said, Blessed are you when they revile, that word revile means to taunt, to scream at, to insult you to your face. Blessed are you when this takes place. Now, I've already pointed out in chapter 11 that this kind of behavior has already been mainstreamed. I shared with you out of Acts 11:26 how that the disciples were called first Christians in Antioch. I mentioned to you that that was actually a, 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 a way of, of putting them down. It was a nickname. The Antioch, uh, the people of Antioch were were uh, quick to give nicknames to people, and they would use them as sometimes as used to demean people. And so, to be called a Christian was not something that you were necessarily quote-unquote proud of, it was something that was intended to demean you because as I've shared the last couple of times with you, uh, Christian is, is a word that means possessed by or owned by Jesus, owned by Christ. And so to be a slave in the Greek society was the lowest thing. And for you to say that you were a Christian meant that you were owned by him or possessed by him, meaning you were his servant, was something they used as a slam, a slur. That's how they would speak about it. So they began to revile. They also be, were persecuting. The word persecute speaks actually, literally persecute means to pursue with the intent to do harm, to physically injure. And so Jesus had spoken about that. He said, they're going to revile you. They're going to speak these things to your face, but they're also going to pursue you to do you injury, to hurt you. And then he said, they'll say all kinds of evil against you falsely. They're going to talk not only to your face, but they're also going to talk behind your back. And it's all intended to injure you. And so again, violence against Christians has by now become permissible. After Stephen had been martyred, Saul had launched a violent attack against Christians. He gives his testimony more than one time in the book of Acts, but in chapter 26, he was speaking in verse 11, and, and Saul, by now called Paul, said, Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down to foreign cities. And so persecution is escalating from the reviling to pursuing to now to death. Now initially persecution was religious in nature, but now the government has gotten involved in, and Herod the king had harassed believers. He had taken the apostle James and he, he had beheaded him. Now, he had seen that it pleased the Jewish religious leaders, and when he saw that, he went on to arrest the apostle Peter. Now, again, we need to keep in mind that not all Jews were against Jesus. The church was birthed in Jerusalem. All the original members were Jewish. Well, after Pentecost, multitudes of Jews had become followers of Christ. So it's not the average Jewish person that's becoming violent. It's the religious leaders who are stirring that up. The Sadducees and the Pharisees, who are religious, uh, religious sect, if you will, uh, in particular, were in strong opposition. And so Herod wanted to please the Jews who were in opposition, but especially the leaders. And he had beheaded James. But he went on to arrest another apostle. This time, he had arrested the apostle Peter. He placed him in prison. He had a reinforced detail that was watching him, placed him between two guards, and he handcuffed the apostle to them. He placed guards in front of the door to prevent an attempt to free him. And as we saw, Peter was sound asleep. And Peter, even though he's there shackled in a, in a cell, he is sound asleep because he's trusting in the Lord. Psalm 4, verse 8, I will lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me 
dwell in safety. And so that's what we've seen up to this point. We pick up now at verse 7, where it says, Behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, a light shone in the prison. He struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Now, Luke is making it very clear how startling this really is. This is completely unexpected. The angel is standing there by the apostle. Light shines in the prison. That light, the reason it speaks concerning light when it says a light shone in the prison, the reason that it's speaking of that is it's showing to us that this is an angel that has been sent from God. Because angels in Scripture often are described in this way. Remember in Luke 24, verse 4, when the women were at the empty tomb, it says, while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood before them. And so this is telling us that it's an angel of the Lord. And it says in verse 7 that he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, arise quickly. Now, how startling would that be, you know, to have someone tap you? It doesn't say that he punched him. It says that he hit him on the side, kind of like you wives do when your husband's snoring, that kind of thing. He said, rise quickly. When he awoke, the chains fell off of him. It's been said that chains will never be able to hold anyone whom God has set free. And that's what's taking place here. He's being set free. Psalm 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps about those who fear him, and he delivers, he rescues, he rescues them. The angel of the Lord encamps about the righteous and delivereth them. And that's what's taking place here. And as he does so, verse 8, the angel says to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. So he did. He said to him, put on your garment and follow me. You know, very often in Scripture, the Lord will send his angels to do something on his behalf. In this particular case, the angel is is preparing Peter to be released. And as he's speaking to him, he's saying to him, basically, he's saying, it's time to get dressed. It's time to go. You see, when Peter had gone to sleep, he had removed his cloak, his belt, and his sandals. And that's why he's telling him to put these things back on. He's saying, gird yourself, tie on your sandals, put on your garment, Follow me. As believers, we should always be ready to go. We should be ready to go at any time. We should be ready to move when the Lord is moving us. We should be walking in the freedom that he's given us. And we should be dressed for the occasion, if you will. We should put on the robe of righteousness like it speaks of in Isaiah 61.10. Our way should be girded with the belt of truth, like it says in Ephesians 6, 14. On our feet, we are to wear the preparation of the gospel of peace, like it says in Ephesians 6, 15. We should be ready. We should be prepared because we're going to move out soon. The time is coming, and it's not that far away. Anybody who sees the signs of the times, anybody who's reading their Bible and aware of the events that are taking place, this has to be something that awakens the church to the moment we're living in. The Bible tells us that we're to be prepared at any time to leave. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. I didn't know that God was preparing the church to take the church to be with him. When I first got saved, nobody had ever told me anything about a rapture. Nobody had ever told me that the time was going to come, that he was going to take us. But I was taught after getting saved to be prepared because it can happen at any moment. The Lord's return is soon. We know that. We're watching what's taking place. We're seeing things line up, even prophetically as they are right now. And we know that we're, we're, uh, we're about to go. Now, when? I'm not going to set it a time or a date, I don't do that, but I know this, I'm supposed to be ready to go. And when the angel taps him and says, get dressed, we're going, we ought to be ready to go. 
We ought to be holding on to things lightly like we were looking the, the other day at the fact that we're to be uh, um, just uh, travel, travel lightly, not to, not to be burdened down to the various cares and concerns of the world, not carrying around material things within our mind thinking, oh, I want to stay a little bit longer. I remember a, a young, young woman who approached me on one occasion. She said, you know, I want the rapture to happen, but I don't want it to happen soon because I want to get married and have children. And I said, no, you don't. That's called the tribulation. <laughs> hmm. I want to get married, have children, and all of that. In, instead of saying, come quickly, Lord Jesus, we're saying, take your time, Lord Jesus. We have to be careful with that because we can be weighed down with the cares of this, this world to the point where we're of no, no good for the kingdom. And so many times I say, well, that person's so heavenly-minded, they're no earthly good. No, I think people are usually more earthly-minded to be of any heavenly good. We're so caught up with the cares and concerns of the world to the degree that sometimes we fail to remember the promises of God, and God is true to his word, and Jesus is coming for his church. He had to be prepared to leave, and he said, get up because it's time to go. Put on your garment. Follow me. Verse 9, so he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. Now today we see that and we think of the automatic opening doors. That was in at that time, obviously. And they went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. Now, you have to picture this for a moment. The angel has struck him on the side. Get up, get prepared, get dressed, we're going. He's still half asleep. That's how deeply at rest he was. So far as he knows at this moment, he's seeing a vision. This isn't really taking place. He goes between the first, he goes through the second guard post, and he's undetected. And there are guards there, but they don't see him. I don't know why. The Bible doesn't say it's possible they had been blinded from seeing them, their eyes being held back, I don't know, maybe they were in a deep sleep, but the final gate is made of heavy iron, it swings open on its own, in verse 11, when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So, when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And so, Peter comes to himself. He goes and says to himself, I, I know for certain this is actually happening. I'm in an open street. I'm no longer chained. I'm free. This is happening. Now, remember, God had delivered him before. Once again, he delivers him. Remember how when the Sadducees had arrested him for preaching, he had been put in jail. And Acts 5.19 says, During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail, brought them out. This has happened to him before. God had delivered him before. God delivered him again. And this time, notice how it said, this time it was from the expectation of the people. What does that mean? The expectation of the people was for him to be executed. So he delivered him from that expectation. He sees... This is no dream. This is no vision. I'm free. I better get out of here, which is what he does. So in verse 12, when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. I want to share with you for a few minutes about this here. This is something that, that you can read and just bypass. I don't want to do that. I want to show you something here and make application at this point here. It says that he came to the house of Mary. Let me give you a little bit of a Bible study about that. Mary is referred to as the mother of Mark, also known as John. John Mark. Many of the Jewish people, Jewish men had two names, John Mark. John Mark is better known to us simply by the name of Mark. Now, Peter, the apostle, refers to him probably because through the ministry of the apostle Peter, John had been saved. Because in 1 Peter 5.13, Peter referred to him as my son Mark. Now, Mark 
was also Barnabas' cousin. Now, later on, we're going to see him accompanying Paul and Barnabas on a mission trip. In Acts 13, verse 5, it says that he was their assistant. Now, here's something for you. Mark wasn't ready for such a journey, and what he did is he abandoned the mission. Acts 13, 13 says that he departed from them, returning to Jerusalem. That led to a severe breach of relationship between Barnabas and Paul. And eventually, that breach was so severe, they went their separate ways. Paul began traveling with someone called Silas. Barnabas began traveling with Mark. And as one with the gift of encouragement, Barnabas helped him to mature. Now, I'm going to develop this a little further in a moment, but in Paul's last letter, he obviously had reconciled with Mark. In 2 Timothy 4.11, he wrote and told Timothy, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark, bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Ultimately, it was Mark who wrote the gospel of Mark. And it was more than likely dictated to him by the apostle Peter. Some have referred to the gospel of Mark as the gospel according to the Apostle Peter, because Mark was his son in the faith, and the details that Mark received would have been from the Apostle Peter. Now here I want to come to a point of application. Sometimes you may be in a place where at one time you had been doing well, and then you failed. In the case of John Mark, John Mark was not ready for ministry. Sometimes people look at ministry and they say, that looks easy. Anybody can do it. What's the big deal? You open up a book, you talk from it. You know, you have seven days in a week. On a Wednesday, you teach a Bible study. On Sunday, you teach a Bible study. And the rest of the week, you, you golf. What else do you, I don't like to golf, but what else is there to it, right? It looks easy, doesn't it? All you got to do is stand up and talk. All you got to do is just share a few things, maybe tell a story, and we'll come back next week. Ministry isn't easy. And if you've been placed into ministry too young or without experience, if you choose to go to help and then you, you fail in that and you return like he did, he, he dropped out, he departed, he abandoned them. We'll look at that next week. He abandoned the ministry is what he did. He didn't just leave. It wasn't, we'll see you later, hugs, kisses, I'll see you at home. He departed. He abandoned them. And the apostle Paul was so upset about it because later on, Barnabas, whose name is son of encouragement, Barnabas says, I want to bring uh, my cousin with me again. And Paul says, no, there's no way. He departed from us. Why would I want to bring somebody who shows himself to be too immature to do ministry? Why would I do that? And, and Barnabas argued with them. You could almost hear the argument. Now, wait a minute, Paul. When you got saved and nobody believed in you, wasn't it me? Wasn't it me who went before people and said, you can trust this guy? And you know that's true because that's what happened. They wouldn't receive you. You were the one breathing out threatenings. You were so upset that you were hailing people to be taken in chains and, and, and even executed. But I showed you the love of Christ. I was there for you. I helped you. But now you won't receive him. You won't take my cousin because he had abandoned us, because he was too young, inexperienced. And, and it was so severe that they departed and actually developed two different ministry teams. Barnabas took off with and ministered to his, his uh, cousin, Mark. And Paul ended up taking a man named Silas or Silvanus, which you see in Scripture. He became his traveling companion. Not only that, but when you read your Bible, you're going to notice there's going to be a transition. When you're reading your Bible, you see Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. That was the order. Barnabas was in Christ prior to, to Saul, prior to Paul. But eventually you see Luke switching that, and it becomes Paul and Barnabas. And then you see no more Barnabas. Barnabas went off, did his ministry. Now, here's the thing I wanted to share with you. You may have started out well, but you didn't finish well. You may have been somebody who was at every Bible study that you, get, you could get to. You may have been somebody that was very serious about your faith in Christ, even serving the Lord, even doing things on his behalf. 
and somewhere along the line, you got cold. Somewhere along the line, you stopped being faithful. Somewhere along the line, you stopped caring. And now you feel, I can't be used anymore. I want to tell you that this man here, Mark, wasn't prepared, but there was a Barnabas who helped him to prepare. Thank God for the Barnabases in the church. Thank God for the sons of encouragement that will put their armor on your shoulder when you failed and will say, God will still use you. God can use you. I've told this story before. Some of you haven't heard it. Encouragement goes a long way in somebody's life. When my wife Maria and I were newly married, we were living in a small apartment in Roland Heights. We had nothing. There's an old saying that we didn't have two nickels to rub together. We were just making it week by week. I was going to school at Biola, and I had to quit because I had no money to pay tuition. I couldn't go. I was doing a job, working a job that was minimum wage, barely making it. My wife had to work, and she continued working. My wife had to continue working until the weekend before she had our first child because I couldn't make enough money to pay $175 a month rent. I didn't have any money, and I'd lost all hope. And one day, one night, my little pregnant wife was in this, our little kitchen, and I was depressed, and so I went to the store. I said, I'll be right back, and went and bought some beer. I was an alcoholic prior to coming to Faith in Christ. And I went and bought some beer. And I came home, and I sat in the front room, and I started drinking. It wasn't enough. So I said, I'll be right back. And I went and bought some more. I came home and drank until I started feeling the effects of the alcohol. Some of you have been in our fellowship for a long time, and you know tears come easy to me. That's because you didn't know me before, because I never cried. I wasn't one who cried. For me, an excuse to cry was alcohol. An excuse to show emotion was alcohol. And so I would bottle up my feelings and not say anything, and I had done so in this case. So I went and drank, and I got a little bit high, and my wife had never seen me drink. She didn't know me as that. I was her Bible study teacher. She came to faith in a Bible study I was giving. She'd never seen that side of me. She didn't know that side of me. And I didn't want her to see me like that. So I walked upstairs, and I turned off the light in my room. I laid down on my bed. We didn't really have a bed. We had a fold-out couch that we used. I didn't even have money to buy a bed. And I started to cry. Closed my door, and I put a pillow over my mouth, and I sobbed, weeping, like my heart would break. But my little girl, my girl heard me. She walked up. I still remember hearing those steps up the up the uh, stairs and the door swinging open and the light shining on me as I had my pillow over my face, weeping. She came and sat next to me. What's wrong? I'm a failure. You married the wrong guy. You, ri- you married the wrong man. You deserve so much more than I am. I can't afford anything. I'm working a job that doesn't provide. You're pregnant. 
What am I going to give to my child? What am I giving to you? And I wept and I said, I thought I was called. But look at me. I've gone back. I'm a failure. And I just wept. She grabbed me and pulled me over and put my head on her shoulder and rocked me like I was a child. She, I still remember holding me like this as I wept. And she said, you're not a failure. God will use you. I believe in you. And I'm standing here right now because I married an encourager. It goes a long way. It goes a long way. And I thank God for men like Barnabas. Paul was rigidly right. He's not ready for ministry. But Barnabas came alongside and he brought him up. So the last word that Paul ever says of him in his last letter is that he's of use to me. He is useful to me, he said, in ministry. And it is Mark who wrote the gospel of Mark. So somebody may be whispering in your ear that you're worthless, you're not needed, you're no good. But God doesn't say that. God says, I forgive every sin. I will make you as clean and as white as snow. I can give you a new life. I love you and I will forgive you. Just come to me. That's how it works in the kingdom of God. And so I wanted to do that because I know that there are some sometimes who may be feeling even as I one time felt in that way. And so we were told earlier that there was constant prayer being offered up to God for, for the apostle Peter who was imprisoned because they knew what was going to take place. So as he gets to the house, there's a large amount of believers and they are fervently praying. Now, here's another aside very, very quickly. The fact that a large group of people had fit into one house will tell us something. It tells us that Mary was very wealthy that she had a house that was large enough to hold a lot of people, and that she had servants. Now, in the New Testament, there are wealthy people that did follow Christ. And you read your Bible, you know Peter, James, John, and Andrew were businessmen. They had two homes. They were well off. Matthew was a tax collector. He was well off. You had Nicodemus, who was rich. You also had Joseph of Arimathea, who was rich. Zacchaeus was rich as well as Barnabas. Barnabas had a lot of money. He was able to sell a dwelling he had, and he gave the proceeds to the church. These people were wealthy, and Mary was a wealthy follower of Christ. And that was a bit unusual, even though there were others who also were wealthy, because people who were financially wealthy didn't necessarily follow him. Remember how that Mark tells us of that rich young ruler? who had come to Christ and said, how can I inherit eternal life? And Jesus had said, well, you know the commandments, keep them. And he said in, in Mark 10, 18, he said, you shall not murder, shall not commit adultery, shall not steal, shall not give false testimony, shall not defraud. He said, honor your father and your mother. And the young man said, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I yet lack? Mark 10, 21 through 23 says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have, give to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven, then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard, how difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. It's not impossible, but it truly is hard. Why? Because it's easy to trust in money. Trusting in wealth is so, so common. Jesus had to warn against it in Luke 12, 15. He said, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life doesn't consist in an abundance of possessions. Well, at this time, many believers in Jerusalem had become poor. They had been persecuted. They needed help. The believers cared for one another, and they helped one another. We saw that when relief aid was sent to the church in Jerusalem, and and Mary had become a follower of Christ, and she used her, her wealth to bless the church. Well, verse 13, Peter was knocking at the door of the gate, and a girl named Rhoda came to answer. 
when she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she didn't open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. They said to her, you're beside yourself. Yes, she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it's his angel. Now Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to, to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. He said, go and, and tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. And so there he is knocking at the door. And Rhoda opens the door. Well, she didn't open. She stands there. She hears his voice. And so she's excited, and she goes and tells everybody. But she leaves Peter knocking at the door. And she runs and tells the prayer meeting, Hey, guess what? Your prayers have been answered. And they say, Shut up. You're crazy. That's what they're saying here. You are beside yourself. You're crazy. No, no. He said, Well, the Bible says, Call unto me. I will answer thee. Show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Just call on to me. I'll show you these things. Well, they had forgotten that God can do the impossible. God had set Peter free before. Why couldn't he do it a second time? I was sharing with somebody just today that our lessons of faith are normally repeated over our lifetimes. We may think that we hear something and know something for sure, but there's no doubt we only know a layer of truth, and God is going to bring that over and over and over until we become deep in our understanding. They had forgotten that God could do the impossible, but he's repeating this so that they might learn that he does. When they, said in, when they said in verse 15, you're beside yourself, you are someone who is not in your right mind, but she kept insisting that it's so. So what is their next thing? Well, they get spiritual. Okay, you're not crazy. Then it's his angel. So she's arguing with them. No. So they say, well, it's his guardian angel. Now, it's interesting that that some believe that every true Israelite had what was called a guardian angel. They believed that it was assumed the appearance of the one that it protected. Again, in Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encampeth about the righteous. And that was a verse that, and delivers them. That's a verse that they, would, that they, they thought of, is that there's an angel of the Lord who is encamping about us as a guardian. In Matthew 18, verse 10, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. So they believed in a guardian angel. So they said, well, then it must be the guardian angel. Well, Peter continued knocking, verse 16. Imagine that. He's outside there going, let me, guys, let me in. Let me in. Let me in. Dave's not here. Let me in. That's an old thing. Only old people know what I just said. Well, it says, but motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Go and tell these things to James and to the brethren. He departed and went to another place. He did so in order that he might protect them because he's a wanted man. Very quickly here. There's a difference of opinion concerning which James this is. In the New Testament, there are three men referred to as James. We already saw James, the brother of John, who had been beheaded. But there was another James you see in Scripture. His name is James, uh, the son of Alphaeus. He was one of the original apostles. Then you have a third one named James, and it's James who is the Lord's brother. And you see that in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. It seems that the Lord's brother had become overseer of the Jerusalem church. John 7 tells us at first he didn't believe in the Lord, but later he came to faith in Christ because in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7, the apostle Paul said that Jesus appeared to James and then to all the apostles. James became the overseer of the church in Jerusalem, and, and Paul spoke of him to the Galatians in chapter 1, verse 19, when he said, I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. In Galatians 2, verse 9, 9 he said, James, Cephas, and John those esteemed as pillars gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. So this would be James, the Lord's brother. Now he wanted James as overseer to know that he was okay and others to be informed. And then it says he departed and went to another place to keep them safe. And finally, beginning at verse 18 and concluding, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Now, Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. 
But they came to him with one accord, having made blasts the king's personal aid their friend. They asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. The people kept shouting, the voice of a god, not a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he didn't give glory to God. He was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. They also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Let's conclude very briefly here. Peter's not there. There's no small stir. He somehow has escaped. Paranoid would be a word you could use to describe Herod. He thought that there was a conspiracy, so he executed the guards. That way he was able to say, well, Peter had been allowed to escape. And so what he did is Herod executed them because he didn't want the faith of Christ to gain any traction. So as the cruel man that he was, he killed the guards so they were guilty of nothing. Well, later on, and as we see in verse 20 and following, Herod had been angry at the people of Tyre and Sidon, which is to the north in modern Lebanon. It says that the Phoenician cities were dependent on him for supplies. And so they're wanting to find favor with him. So according to verses 21 and 22, Herod came before them and he gave a speech. And he did so in a place called Caesarea, which we go to every time we go to Israel. There's an amphitheater there. Now, the, the historian Josephus said that Herod was wearing a robe made of silver thread. And when he entered the amphitheater early in the morning, the sun shone on it. It was brilliant. The people began to cry out, he's not a man, he's a god. And then Josephus states that Herod neither rebuked them nor rejected their impious flattery. The scripture says an angel of the Lord struck him. He didn't give glory to God. He was eaten by worms. Ooh. That may be what is called the dog tape worm. Sheep and cattle serve as hosts for this parasite. The dog eats infected meat, and man gets infected from the dog. The disease included the formation of cysts, generally on the liver, that may have extended into the abdominal cavity. The rupture of a cyst may release as many as two million developing worms. Yeah, huh? Think of that next time we have a potluck. And, <laughs> and he died a painful death. History records that's how he died. Scripture simply tells you why. He was consumed by worms. Cornelius when the apostle Peter had ministered to him, attempted to give him honor that was not his due, and Peter rejected it. But Herod accepted it. Voice of God and not a man. And God says, no, there's only one God. I will give my glory to no one else. And he died. What is the result? We'll close. The word of God grew and multiplied. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. They also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. The word of God grew and multiplied. The enemy may do everything he can to squash the ministry of the word. He may use politicians to try and outlaw its preaching. He may have people who are standing in front of abortion clinics protesting. He may, he may, the enemy may inspire them to be removed or even arrested. He does everything he can to keep the word of God from being proclaimed. But always remember this, please. Persecution does not stamp out the fire. It just causes it to, to move on, to actually spread. Affliction and persecution, rejection always does that. And you're going to have it. If you're following the Lord and you're open with your faith, there are going to be people who will verbally speak to you. Sometimes they may even strike you. That's possible. It does happen. There's a lot of persecution throughout this world. Many, many of us American Christians may not endure the kind that's really going on everywhere in other places. But it does exist. And one of the places that I see persecution, and I'll close by saying this, 
I see one of the places where it's most open and yet people don't realize it is in, in our educational system. It's in our educational system where, where they're attempting, where people are attempting to grab the minds of our children as young as three and four years of age and to pour into them things that are not biblical, that are not right, that are not moral. And they're pouring into them at an early age. And then when, when Christians stand up and say, wait a minute, that's my child. I have the right to educate them. You don't have the right to say those things to them. Then we're the people who are looked at as being the social terrorists. And that's take, we know that. That's what's taking place now. Your children are being taken from you. You send them through school up into college. When you get into college, I, had, I, I didn't go to only Christian colleges. I went to, to secular college, and, and one of my particular professors uh, asked us on the first day, I was a social science major at Cal Poly, and one of our, uh, my professors said, how many of you are, are born again Christians? How many of you are? I raised my hand along with three or four of the people in the class. And he said, I feel sorry for you because you follow what is said in this little book. I follow science. You follow re religious superstition. And the very first day, in the very opening, he put us down. And he didn't have a problem doing that. I still remember how he said on one occasion, he said, there is no, there is no uh, proof that smoking cigarettes, there's no proof that smoking cigarettes uh, will lead to lung cancer. There's no proof. He said, I have on my desk studies that confirm that there is no correlation between smoking cigarettes and lung cancer. And then later on, I heard he died of lung cancer. And see, see, I never was, I wasn't intimid, intimidated by that. You can be, why? Because these guys have PhDs. These guys got multiple degrees. I had one professor who had two masters and a PhD. And you're in that class and, and, and they're not believers. And, and you're thinking, what do I have to say to them? And I learned a long time ago, just open your mouth, God will fill it. Take the opportunity to share and God will give you, he'll, he'll give you favor. And that happens and I saw that. Either you be, become quiet or you open your mouth. Now me, I decided to open my mouth. Why? Because I said to the Lord when I got saved, if you send no one, send me. I'm willing to speak in your name. I'll do what I can. And I want all of us to be of that. People are going to hell. The church needs to speak the truth. There are people who are taking your children's mind and brainwashing them, but the word of God washes it clean. We need to give them the word of God. That's just, it just makes sense to me. Train up a child in the way he should go when he's old. He won't depart from it. Give him devotion. Speak to him about the things of the Lord. Teach them that athletics and, and being on a soccer team and a softball team or a baseball team is not important, more important than eternity. May they enjoy their sports, but may they not worship it. Because none, hardly any, if at all, are ever going to be professionals at that sport. But they're going to live and they're going to die. That's 100%. We need to build into them the faith of Christ so they know the things of the Lord. And do not be intimidated. Don't go out picking fights. Don't stand on street corners yelling at people, hey, you're going to hell. Want to talk about it? Don't do that. <laughs> but when given the opportunity, open your mouth. That's why you're there. You are salt. You are light. You have the word. You should preach it. And so the word of God grew and multiplied. The more the enemy said, shut up, the more they opened their mouth because we ought to obey God rather than man. We will speak when given the opportunity. And that's what God has called the church to. Never forget that. You have been sent by God with a mission. Be faithful. And watch what God will do.